I cannot wait for you to hear from this remarkable panel. So I'm going to turn it over to you ladies now. Thank you. And good morning. Good morning to all of you. It's good to see you guys. Um, so I am joined by two fantastic women, Julie Brown and Barbara Quiones. Um, Julie, right here, serves as a secretary of the Florida Department of Business and Professional Regulation, where she leads the state's regulation of more than 1.4 million licenses across more than 30 fields of industry. Secretary Brown joined the department following three terms of service on the Florida Public Service Commission. Secretary Brown served as commission chairman from 2016 to 2018. And as chairman, she also established initiatives to build and strengthen links between the commission and its stakeholders with improvements in technology, communication, and quality of service. And I will tell you all, because I know Julie very well and we are friends, that we missed her um, at the commission, but she really represented Florida very well at that, in that role. Next to um, Julie is a new friend, Ms. Barbara Quiones. Barbara is the Director of Electric Utilities for the City of Homestead. She serves as the elected chair of the Florida Municipal Power Agency's Board of Directors, where she has been on the board since 2009. Previously, she worked for 26 years. You do not look like you could have worked anywhere 26 years, Ms. Barbara. Thank you. Um, at Florida Power and Light in a variety of positions, including Senior Manager of Statewide Distribution Planning and Design and Senior Manager of Statewide Power Restoration and Power Quality. Please welcome both Julie and Barbara. So we're gonna talk a little bit about rulemaking for innovation, resilience, and affordability in the energy and a little bit about the water sector. And I'm just gonna just share with you all a couple of things. Um, First of all, if you think about the energy sector, there are actually three types of utility companies. And Barbara's gonna tell you the differences, but there are investor-owned utilities, like a Florida Power and Light. There are municipal utilities, like the city of Homestead. And there are also um, rural electric cooperatives. Um, and so each of them are regulated, but by different bodies and in different ways um, at the state and local level, in addition to federally. So at the federal level, um, investor-owned utilities, and most of them are um, regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They regulate transmission lines and other things. Um, and then for water companies, they're going to be regulated primarily by the EPA, Clean Water Act, et cetera. So Barbara, I'm going to ask you the first question, which is, first of all, share a little bit about how you got into the role that you were in. Um, why don't you start with that so okay. people have a sense of who you are. All right. Thank you, Paula. Uh, it's an honor to be here today with uh, this wonderful group of ladies as well. And I guess I got started in the, the, path, the path that I chose to take and probably in the eighth grade. I took an <laughs> electronics class, my best friend and I. Uh, we wanted to be in a class that was all boys. And <laughs> so we, we signed up for electronics and uh, I just fell in love. I fell in love with the problem solving. I, I fell in love with understanding electricity and circuitry and, and fixing things that were broken. And that may be a, a female quality that I have is trying to, to fix things that, uh, that need to be repaired. And uh, from there, I went on to study engineering at, the, uh, at Georgia Tech in Atlanta. And after graduating from Georgia Tech, I started off at Florida Power and Light and um, worked through a variety of jobs, as, as, uh, as Paula mentioned, and uh, moved into to supervision there, which I loved. And that was working with the, uh, the field employees, the folks that you see going out and repairing the power lines. Uh, I, I worked with those gentlemen. And it was just very, very rewarding. Again, we were, we were um, providing a service to the community, and we were fixing things when they were broken. At one point, I had the restoration team, the people that show up when your power's out. And so while everyone is not very happy when their power's out, they're all usually really happy when the power comes back on. And so it's just very, very rewarding field. And uh, I left FPL when an opportunity opened up in Homestead. And I, I run the municipal electric organization there in Homestead. Homestead is a city just south of Miami. And uh, 
I started participating in the overall organization for the Florida Municipal Power Agency, which um, is an organization that brings together 30, 32 cities that have municipal power organizations throughout the state of Florida. And we partner together um, for economies of scale, for, for, for power generation and member services and uh, engineering analysis. Uh, we serve about, I think it's 1.2, 1.4 million customers in the state of Florida through the, the municipal, um, the municipally owned electric utilities. And I guess it all started back in eighth grade. So that's, <laughs> that's, amazing. that's, that's my you. story. Eighth grade, okay. Well, you know what, anything to be near the boys. I, I understand that. <laughs> so Julie, you are a, an attorney by train. Talk to us about how you've ended up in really a career of public service. Thank you. Um, so yes, I went to law school. I'm a native Floridian. Um, went to law school and undergrad at University of Florida. Go Gators. And bad football season this year, but um, very proud of our state. Um, started in the private sector. Um, really did not enjoy uh, the private practice and somehow migrated to be a city attorney, which is how I got into public service after all. Um, I was a city attorney in Tampa, um, really uh, did some great, I felt like it was rewarding work. Um, left because I wanted to run for city council against an incumbent city council member, so it was a little inappropriate to, to, to be there. So I went in-house with a big publicly traded company um, drafting contracts, and uh, which actually, I'll, I'll, it circled back because it led me to the PSC. Ran against him, I lost by 1,400 votes. Um, not that I'm still counting them. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it was, it was a really uh, enriching experience, actually, the city r running for office. It, it was, um, it was a, a family affair, really. I just had my first baby, and I had committed to running against him, uh, the man uh, that I ran against, and it was, um, it was very hard. It was very challenging because a lot of actual women were saying, how can you run when you have a baby? Um, so it was a real, I was a very um, elucidating experience. I will never run again. Um, I do like the appointments process much better. So I was in-house counsel, continue to do that. And um, folks, I was headed up to Tallahassee doing a lot of regulatory affairs work and uh, ran into an old high school friend, uh, college friend. He said, hey, there's four seats opening up on the Florida Public Service Commission. The Senate rejected two of the confirmation. They were supposed to confirm two commissioners, and then the governor failed to reappoint two, so that's four seats, which is unheard of. There's only five in uh, Florida. So that's really, it was a very monumental time. So you should do that. I had no idea what that was. He said, you like public service? Run for public service, I mean, you know, go, for, go through the process. So I, you know, I missed it. I really missed it, uh, being a part of something that was very rewarding. I applied for it, went through a nominating council process, did not make the cut the first time. The other two seats opened up a month later, went through that process, got, uh, my name got forwarded to the governor, met with the governor at the time. Um, I was not supposed to get it, and I somehow just serendipitously got it. There were uh, seven other much more qualified people, and I got it, and then I stayed on there through three other governors. Um, they continued to get reappointed, got involved in national issues, as you know, Paula, because we've done a lot of panels together. Uh, very passionate about energy, um, but th this governor, Governor DeSantis, gave me an opportunity in February after over 10 years at the PSC to lead a huge, huge agency. It's the Department of Business and Professional Regulation. Um, we actually regulate this hotel. Um, it is just an incredible um, opportunity to run something that impacts the lives of so many. So, But my heart is still in the energy sector. Yeah. I'm looking forward to yeah. talking a little bit more about it's that. great business. It is. So Barbara, talk about kind of Homestead as a municipal utility. So why don't you share with everybody kind of the difference between an investor-owned utility, which you worked for at Florida Power Light, and a municipal. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the biggest issues, or, or the biggest uh, differences, I guess I should say, one of the biggest differences between the two is that an investor-owned utility is regulated by the Florida Public Service Commission and they are not allowed to um, make changes to their operation or their rates without the PSC reviewing and approving it. At a local level for a municipal organization, a municipal electric utility is um, 
provided oversight by the city council or city commission, or in some cases, a utility board. And those are locally elected officials who have the oversight for that, that organization. So one of the biggest differences is that the people who are making the decisions in a municipal utility are the elected officials. And they're, of course, much more accessible to the public. Um, not that the Public Service Commission is not accessible. They, they very much are. I've contacted them myself. <laughs> but um, the, the elected officials have the ultimate say on, on setting the policy and even the rates and, and making all the rules. So that's probably the biggest difference. What we also like to say is that we're part of the community. Um, the people who, who work in our organization, the majority of them live in that community. They're customers of the organization. And they have a vested interest, and they have a pride in what they do, and they want to perform to the very best because it's their community. And we say that um, at, at Homestead Public Services Energy, you're, you're not just a customer, you're our neighbor. And so it's, it's a very, very different um, dynamic because of the, the sense of community that you get and the accessibility of the decision makers. And so I guess to me, those are the, the biggest differences, that we're part of the, the community and that the public, the community, the customers all have access to those decision makers immediately should they, they have any type of concern. She may not be allowed to say this, but I can. Uh, the city, uh, when a, a city municipal is much more political um, than the public serve an investor-owned utility. Can't, I can't say that. Can't but say it's that. true. It's true, though. <laughs> and, and they don't have the technical expertise um, as public service commissions around the country. Yeah. Yes. So Sorry. let's talk. No, no. So let's, let's continue, Julie, and tell us about who actually is the customer from a commissioner's perspective. Um, people might be surprised to hear that you have lots of customers. So why don't you share a little bit about the cus who the customer is and the differences between those customers and how you think about them when you're in a role of decision making. Everyone is the customer, whether it is the legislators who, of course, you know, as a public service commissioner, you're, you have to go through a Senate confirmation process and they are stakeholders. They are key stakeholders, they are the customer. The governor is the customer. The utilities are the customer. The customers are the customer. It is a uh, all-encompassing um, position. Uh, as a public service commissioner, you have to go out in the field. You have to go through stakeholder events, different types of community events. You have to hold customer meetings to, to get input. So it really, I mean, it, it, it's a challenge and you're never gonna make everybody happy. That's the, the one, thing of being in a position of a public officer, you're just not gonna make everybody happy and you just have to be okay with that and make the right decision. Yeah, I might suggest that if you don't make everybody happy, you're probably doing a pretty exceptional job. That's probably a student <laughs> That's right probably, there. That's right. That's probably doing pretty well. So um, let's expand on that, right? We heard a little bit earlier about the CLEAR program and, and how they're gonna have focus on education, but if people wanna get involved and be engaged in this process, how do they do that? How do you get engaged in this process? I see that my rates are gonna go up. Um, I see that they want to build a new substation in my neighborhood. Um, how does that work? Absolutely, I, and I, we encourage people, uh, when I was chairman of the commission, that was one of my big initiatives was to get customers more engaged, get people out there. No, you know, we, we live stream every meeting. Um, I still say we, even though I'm at the department of DBPR, but we, they live stream every single meeting to encourage people access to give them access, like you would have access at a city council meeting. Um, we improved our technology so that customers can immediately have access to um, all of the commissioners when they, if they have questions. Mm -hmm. um, I encourage it because nobody wants their rates to go up. In fact, during COVID, uh, I was a commissioner and we, we, we reduced, we actually did away with all of the late fees for folks that were having, struggling to have problems. And we tried to send that message out to our local community so that they knew that we were trying to provide rate relief. And, and, and this is a follow-up, what is the role of the commission in terms of the, the relationship with the company itself? And how do you think about 
Um, because these companies have shareholders. Mm -hmm. How do you guys think about all of that stuff? We try to be impartial and try to be more like a quasi-judicial role. Okay. So we do absolutely consider the shareholders and because ultimately their bond ratings will help reduce debt to the customers, to the end user. So we do balance those, um, but we do hold them as a third party, um, you know, at a distance. Of course, we do get to see them at conferences, but uh, we don't have direct uh, contact because it would be considered ex parte mm -hmm. communication. So. Yeah. And so how would it work for a municipal? If I'm, if I'm in Homestead and I'm a little irritated um, by the, the, the utility company and I called you and you did not call me back fast enough or whatever that is, how do I engage in that kind of situation? Of course that wouldn't happen because I, I would, I would call, call me immediately. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But uh, good question. It's um, a little bit different process. As, as Julie mentioned, they, the customers can come to the city council meetings. We have been fortunate that we have reduced rates over the last 12 years. Um, and we are actually, at this point in time, our residential rate is, is lower than FPL, and FPL is our neighbor. And so our customers are a little quieter than they've been in the past when our rate was higher than FPL. But uh, they have the opportunity to come to the city council meeting. Um, they can do public comments or they can speak on any, any given agenda item. If we had an agenda item addressing rates or some type of policy issue for the customers, they have every opportunity to come and speak. They also have access to the mayor. They have access to their council people. They have access to me. They have access to my leadership team. So there are just a variety of, of venues that they can take advantage of to, to make their voice be heard. Um, and we're very open to, to hearing the comments from, from our, our constituents. And we will consider them and make changes as appropriate. So they, they, have, they have a very great amount of access to the decision makers. And so let, I'm going to play the cynic. OK. Um, because these are still big organizations. And if I'm just one customer, is my opinion really that, value, that valuable? Are you really going to listen to that one person who may have a complaint versus all the other people who may have a different opinion? Well, well I would say yes. Um, I value every single individual, and I know that uh, there, there are times when I've learned from just one individual. And so, yes, of course, every single person is important. And when you start to see a pattern, then that makes it even more apparent that there's, there's some kind of problem that we have to address. If I have one customer who's concerned that their power is fluctuating, we're going to investigate that. If I have 15 customers who tell me their power is fluctuating, we're pretty sure we have a problem. And we're, we're you know, definitely moving in to see what do we need to do to take care of this. But every individual voice is important. And I'm, if I may just add yes. onto that, as an economic regulator, it is critical, actually. We would host meetings in the field. As I said, mm -hmm. uh, there was this one water case where a customer brought a container of the water, um, and it was uh, pretty murky, and pictures and documentation. And that one customer actually she catapulted a whole group of people. And it made such a difference. It actually led to the legislature to create a water study committee, um, and the, I, which I chaired. And it was uh, 19 people were on that committee. And we made recommendations to the legislature to improve quality of service. Customers, that one person, though, spearheaded that whole thing that led to changes right now that are in law. Well, I, and I will share with you that I used to be the lobbyist who would go after people <laughs> like Julie, and it would be one customer. Uh -huh. And so I just want you all to leave with understanding that the, the power of your voice is real, and it is a very big deal when customers show up at public hearings, um, either at the commission or elsewhere, and make comment. And companies take it incredibly seriously, um, as well as commissioners. So I know oftentimes people think, ah, oh, it's not a big, I can tell you how many hours I have spent trying to respond because one customer made a complaint and we have to step it up. So please know that that, right, that's like a big difference. And because customers rarely show up, 
So if it's just one person, you're like, well, it must really be bad if this person came because customers rarely don't participate, like at most civic processes. That's, that's true. And dur again, during COVID, we had different types of proceedings with customers, and they, we tried to encourage. It was all remote, and we tried to get, encourage people to come out, and they wouldn't come out. We had major proceedings that impacted their pocketbooks, and we tried to let people. Uh, and we, so then we didn't. We couldn't even make a very balanced decision if you don't have that customer input. Yeah. Yeah. So we have. A little bit more than a minute left. Final thoughts, what would you want to leave um, these ladies with as they think about how they're going to engage more with our industry? I say go to as many meetings and network as much as you can. <laughs> I, the state, uh, I think the, the founder originally said here um, that you need to be engaged. You need to network. You need to meet with these people because one person can change your whole life. I cannot reiterate that. That is so true. One person can make all the difference in your, whether it's personally or professionally. So network, network, network. Awesome. Barbara. Wow. I think Julie said it. Get involved. Get involved in your communities. Get involved when you see a problem. That's a great story about the water. One person can make a difference. And each and every one of you can be that one person. So participate. Get involved. Uh, get involved in things that you're passionate about. I was speaking with um, Blair, I believe it is. And she was talking about her involvement with some just critical abuse of young people. Get involved in what the things that you're passionate about. And if you're really concerned about something, jump in there, attend those meetings. Mm -hmm. And that's time. So please join me in thanking Julie and Barbara for their time and their insights. So nice to have talk to you. Thank you. We are now, one second, because of course my iPad went off, you guys, and I can't remember stuff. So you're, we're moving into a video, but I want to be able to tell you who it is. Um, so we're going to hear from two members of the House Commerce Committee on Energy and Commerce on how federal policies impact water and power in our communities. So we're going to watch these interviews with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell and Congresswoman Catherine McMorris Rogers. Congress plays a really critical role in creating federal policies. Uh, I, I'm somebody, if you, if you could talk to me about water uh, all the time. I think water is a basic human right. I believe that Congress has got a very critical role to play in uh, creating policies that move innovation and technology forward uh, to invest in clean energy and water infrastructure as well as collaborating with other policymakers in the administration to make sure we're addressing problems that we need to address. So on water, you know, we had, a, I come from the state of Michigan, uh, Flint, what had children being poisoned by lead in their water. Uh, Congress, it took too long, was working with EPA. There were failures of both the federal and the state level to address problems that needed to be done. We passed legislation at the federal level to try to ensure that no community would ever experience what Flint experienced again. Uh, unfortunately, we're still seeing it happen. And so I'm pushing EPA very hard in the Congress to would require the elimination of lead in all pipes, water pipes in this country. There was a study that was done uh, in October or that was released by the pediatric JAMA that showed that 50% of all children whose blood was tested uh, in this country have lead in their blood. That's unacceptable. We know what happens to a child when they have lead in their blood. And I think Congress has got a very serious responsibility um, to address issues like this. Um, to ensure that everybody in this country has access to clean and safe drinking water. But then you talk about energy as well. I mean, these are really complicated issues. Global climate's real. Um, it, we know it. When you see the wildfires, you see the hurricanes. I had eight floods uh, in my city, the city in which I live this summer. Uh, we've got a responsibility to future generations to reduce carbon emissions, to address methane, so many other issues. And that means, again, Congress has responsibility to look at policies 
they're going to protect future generations. I appreciate the work that you're doing and the, the focus on energy. And when it comes to the role of Congress, uh, as I see it, Congress has a an important role to make sure that energy is affordable, that it is reliable for American families and businesses, and that includes electricity. So whether it's power generation, transmission, distribution, we get involved, whether it's uh, through the Department of Energy or the Federal Regulatory Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, that does licensing of major projects in the United States of America. But Clearly, energy is, is it's so important and our ability to produce and distribute energy here in the United States is something that we should be protect, protecting and celebrating. Uh, it, it, energy is foundational to our national security, our competitiveness. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's foundational to our way of life. So it's important that we do not put up barriers and, and throw roadblocks or, around producing reliable energy, whether you think about hydropower electricity or nuclear or natural gas, coal, the kind of energy that keeps the lights on. Oversight is, I think, one of the most serious responsibilities that Congress has. So you keep people accountable uh, in the jobs. We need to know what they're doing and that they're actually implementing the law. EPA is critical on water, uh, but the Department of Energy would obviously on the energy front have responsibility. We want to make sure that they're investing in new technologies. They're overseeing uh, many of the rules and regulations that we've done. But interestingly, I come from the state of Michigan. It's the car state. It's the vehicle state. It's now the state. It put the world on wheels. And now uh, I think of it as the um, mobility uh, industry. The Department of Transportation uh, is the agency that actually oversees that, that in EPA. So we need to work with all of the agencies to ensure that we are the policies we are passing to try to protect in our country, all Americans, uh, is actually being implemented and being done in the right way. Yes. Well, take take the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And I serve as the lead Republican. On the House Energy and Commerce Committee, we are debating policy. We're debating the laws themselves, the bills, and what the policy is going to be, what the law is going to be. But we also have a very important oversight role. And there's a subcommittee on energy and commerce that is that is the oversight committee. And that is where we, as the legislative branch, have a responsibility to have oversight of the agencies within the executive branch. So when it comes to energy, just, just last week, for example, we sent a letter to the energy secretary, Granholm, asking what, what is her department doing? We are, we're headed into winter. We see rising energy costs. Gas prices have reached a, a record high, uh, over a dollar just since the beginning of the year. We see disruptions in supply that, that are threatening brownouts and blackouts as we're heading into winter. And, and, and yet, you know, the focus is on the, the policies around the Green New Deal and the climate summit that's taking place in glass. No. So we sent a letter to the secretary asking her, what, what is she doing to address the energy crisis here at home? That's, that's an example of oversight because as a committee, as, a, as the Republicans, especially on the committee, we're very concerned that the Biden administration has implemented policies that are creating an energy crisis. The, one of the very first executive orders on day one that President Biden signed was to cancel the Keystone Pipeline. And then it wasn't too long after that, weeks after that, he, he said okay to a pipeline that Russia's building, Putin's building for Germany. And that didn't make much, much sense to me. And, and then in addition, as gas prices are going up in the United States of America, because supply is being tapped down here and, and permits uh, the, the exploration development on federal lands, for example, is being prohibited. The Biden administration has reached out to OPEC and asked them to increase production to address gas prices in the United States. So the committee has an oversight role where we ask 
the agency questions, we ask the administration questions, we, we, we want to be holding them accountable for the decisions that they are making that are impacting the reliability and the affordability of energy here in the United States. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed the insight that we were able to get directly from these women that serve on the House Energy and Commerce Committee. We have full length interviews that are going to be available on the app. Uh, I also, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at some of the speakers, we also have Allison Clements, who is the commissioner of FERC. So you heard them reference that Federal Energy Regulatory Committee. She actually did an interview just for us to kind of talk about her role in the state of energy policy. If you also haven't had a chance to listen to Beth Garza from R Street, we have two videos from her, one that is the best explanation I've heard yet about what happened in Texas. So I encourage you after this event to dig into some of this additional content. Um, our team conducted a number of interviews with these women that wanted to participate, but they couldn't join us in person. So a wealth of resources. I know we keep giving you lots of info, but really valuable is here. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break. So if you guys can join us back in here at 1025, uh, we're going to have a roundtable discussion then over our water and power brief. And uh, so I really look forward to us having that opportunity to engage. 10-minute break. Thank you. <laughs>